right there, this is Edwin Lum, President of the Asia Pacific Baptist Federation, as well as Chairman of the Singapore Baptist Convention. And today I'm privileged to be your MC for this session. So it's my privilege to welcome you to today's celebration. We are grateful to Joel Sierra and his team, members from Latin America, for leading us in our opening worship. Today we'll be led in our worship by three different teams from different corners of the world. Later, we will be joined by a team from New Hope Baptist Church in Melbourne, Australia, and a Power Faith band from Nagaland, India. Today, we come together in justice. As Baptists, we seek to witness to our faith in Christ that is rooted in the uniqueness of the Gospel in order to engage deeply in the biblical call to flourish in the midst of brokenness. We long to live as a blessing from neighbourhoods to nations, holistically sharing our faith in Jesus as Lord. Well, committed to a biblical understanding of the image of God in every person, we defend an ethnic of the support of life, support religious freedom for all, stand in solidarity with the marginalized, advocate at every level, train and network proactively, and mobilize for religious freedom, human rights, and justice. It seems fitting with this theme that we be ministered to now by Crystal. Many of you will be familiar with the Wamba brothers who were born in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Caught up in the government crackdown on protesting students in 1990, the brothers were separated with two of them, Michael and Alliston, escaping the country and spending five years in a refugee camp before being sponsored by a Saskatchewan church to immigrate to Canada as refugees, with no idea if any of the other family members were alive, they started their new life in Canada. While they did sadly lose many family members and friends in the uprisings and suffered many terrible injustices, miraculously, eight years after being separated, they were reunited with Fabian, their middle brother in Canada. Together as Crystal, they have gone on to minister to many people around the world, bringing hope and healing. Please allow them to minister to your heart today. Oh, 
Greetings once again in the wonderful name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, it is a great honor and a great privilege uh, to be part of this great, great Congress. We bless the Lord. Recently, I had a privilege to interview Pastor Gentile. Pastor Gentile is the predecessor of Pastor Fanyana Peter Mlope at Mamelodi Baptist Church. Pastor Mlope could not be with us because of health challenges. We're going to hear about a testimony of what happened around 1980s, specifically in 1985, when South Africa was in flames. And just during the time of the struggle for liberation of the country. And Pastor Mshope was called to serve in, in a township, Mamilodi, that is outside Pretoria. And there was a peaceful march the people who went out to go and present their requests, their demands to the local government. But the apartheid government instead retaliated by shooting at defenseless and people whom the greater majority were the pensioners, elderly men and women, with some few young people who were there. And at the end of that terrible day, bodies of people were lying in the streets. It was a massacre in Mamelodi. And Pastor Mshope was requested by the local minister's forum to be the preacher for the mass funeral of all those people who had died on that day. The funeral was held at a local stadium. And we're gonna hear Pastor Gentile share with us how that day impacted both Pastor Mshope's ministry and the ministry of his church totally transformed to become a ministry that is outward looking not inward serving a ministry that is for the community in Mamelodi. After preaching in that uh, funeral you can imagine it was a difficult uh, period for, yes. for the country which was difficult even for him mm -hmm. he had to look after his life yes you know, also, he had to deal with the church that was struggling, mm. whether to be uh, pietistic or, mm. you know, mm. focus on um, uh, social uh, order or issues of social justice in the community. Yes. So he had to drag himself first and then drag the church mm. to understand that uh, the, uh, we, are, we are called for a general public yeah. more than we are called for ourselves. Mm. So from there, Reverend Klope moved from his comfort zone of being just a pastor of a local church mm. uh, to be a pastor of a community, community. which included um, uh, Tintin Masango. And mm. Tintin Masango was a, a child of one of the members mm. in his church. Yeah. So he had no choice, yeah. you know, but to do ministerial work yeah. uh, to the Masango family mm. whilst their son was on death row. Yeah. So he, he had to visit this, the boy uh, or the young man in prison. prison. And whilst in prison praying for this one, all the, the other guys, they wanted, mm. you know, to, to get to that ministry. Mm. And uh, most of the people that he used to pray for us are now the leaders in the country. Mm. And unfortunately, didn't even pass, passed on. Mm. And uh, and God showed them mercy. And and Reverend Kloppe's ministry really uh, took took a turn. Yeah. And it's very interesting just for to help people pick up. This was at the height of the struggle in South Africa. Yeah. When we, we described those days, we said South Africa was, was burning. Yeah. 
And uh, to be a Baptist pastor, to be a pastor who would go and embrace, first of all, the social justice issues mm -hmm. that was making yourself to become the enemy of the state. Yeah. So Pastor Nkrobe became an enemy of the state, of the apartheid state, but he stood for Jesus. Because it is the Lord who said, when I needed you, mm. whether in prison, whether without clothes or without food, you were there for me. And so Pastor Nkrobe visited and ministered to the prisoners who were on death row, yeah. were sentenced to death. We thank God that when the New South Africa came, those prisoners were released. That sentence was withdrawn. But it was a ministry of a Baptist pastor that helped those young men to continue to live because some people would commit suicide once they know that they are on death. Yeah. But then, Muruti, you came in yeah. to the very same church. The church now that was known in the community for its social justice ministry. Yeah. As a young pastor, fresh from the seminar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, that, those were interesting times, Muruti. Uh, you, you're getting into a church. Yeah. One, you're still young and... Uh, and, and two, the church is very old, is known in the township, mm -hmm. and Mkhope had uh, actually left a, a mark. Yeah. So big shoes to fill. Mm -hmm. And then you get in there, you have a young family, you have to, you know, uh, look at, uh, you know, where God is taking the church and how do you fit in there. I think that was the, the most important thing I learned, is to, is to watch... Uh, God working in the community through this church because mm -hmm. what helped me was that I, I did not think that God will start to work with my rival. Mm -hmm. I thought that God was already working yeah. and, and, and upon my my arrival. Mm -hmm. So um, I must say it was also, you know, I, I also had to um, uh, find my way not only into the church but also into the community. Wow. You know, start yeah. to do uh, community work. I remember we started with a simple sermon, just saying to people, if uh, anyone does not have a pastor to bury in our township, I am here. Mm -hmm. And tell people that our church is here. Mm -hmm. And that just opened floodgates, mm -hmm. you know, of people in the community coming to the church asking for help. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we we started getting in uh, mm -hmm. into the community, and people started talking that there is yeah. a pastor somewhere mm -hmm. who can assist you with this one and assist you with that. Yeah. And um, so the most important thing that one had to do was one uh, get to know political leaders in the community, mm -hmm. get to know the police, get to know the clinics, the hospitals, go in there and introduce yourself and uh, get involved in, in most of the things that w were happening in the township. Yeah. Um, what, <laughs> what got worse was that um, uh, uh, what became a serious challenge for me was when now the, there were many killings in Mamelo, um, the fights amongst the, the criminals in the township. Mm. And I found myself mm. right at the mm. center oh, of it. Yeah. Uh, you know, being called by this gang and mm. that gang, mm. whoever dies in both yeah. gangs, Moruti has to come and bury. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Gentile, uh, for sharing uh, with us the story of Pastor Mkhlope and, and your ministry. And um, this is a challenge to all of us. And I believe that the message will go across to say, the Lord has called us to his people. And the most people who need the church are those who are marginalized. Yeah. Those who have no power. Those who look up to God. And we as a church are called upon to stand in and minister to them.
law was given in the Old Testament to point the people to the loving God whose heart was for the poor and the outcast. The coming of the Holy Spirit after the ascension of Christ saw this become a reality in the early church. Let it be done on earth as it is done in heaven. When you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not go over your vineyard a second time or pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and the foreigner. I am the Lord your God. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Do not steal. Do not lie. Do not deceive one another. Do not swear falsely by my name and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. Do not defraud or rob your neighbor. Do not hold back the wages of a hired worker overnight. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Do not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block in front of the blind, but fear your God. I am the Lord. Do not pervert justice. Do not show partiality to the poor or favoritism to the great, but judge your neighbor fairly. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Don't spread gossip and rumors. Do not do anything that endangers your neighbor's life. I am the Lord. They broke bread in their homes. They praised God and enjoyed the favor of all the people. Don't secretly hate your neighbor. If you have something against him, get it out into the open. Otherwise, you are an accomplice in his guilt. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Share with the poor and the foreigner. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Judge your neighbor fairly. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Love your neighbor as yourself. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. They praised God and enjoyed the favor of all the people. And, and the, the Lord, Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Justice is a foundational concept in the Bible. The Old Testament and New Testament terms that are translated justice, or sometimes righteousness, occur more than a thousand times. This should not be a surprise, for justice and righteousness are part of the character of God. Psalm 89.14 says, Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. God is just. He defines what justice means. But if God is just, and his book emphasizes justice so heavily, then why has this concept been largely absent from the teachings and practices of my own Baptist tradition during my growing up years? Why have we not been concerned with issues of justice as Jesus was? In this brief talk, I would like to reflect on the history of our Baptist churches in Lebanon and how God has been transforming our thinking in recent years. Many factors had shaped our churches since their inception. First of all, our churches largely functioned in survival mode. A scholar and specialist on politics and foreign policies in the Middle East analyzes the socio-political factors since the Ottoman Empire rule that forced Middle Eastern Christians to behave the way they do. Sociologically, Christians in the Arab world are perceived as a minority. And politically, they are perceived as domestic expressions of the enemy, even though Arab, Turkish, and Persian Christians share the same political views and patriotism with their Muslim compatriots. In Lebanon, Christians are not as much a minority as in other Arab countries. Nevertheless, Lebanese Christians share many of the same anxieties with other Christians in the region. In response to the prevailing socio-political forces, this analyst suggests that the church in such a context can react in one of three ways – resignation, immigration, or engagement. During the first few decades of the life of the Lebanese Baptist Church, the resignation and immigration reactions were dominant. Churches either kept to themselves, thus ministry became about self-care and not concerned with the outside world, or looked for a better future away from the Arab world. 
Our churches did not have a vision for justice in our own communities. Second, our prevalent theology. Most of the Baptist churches in Lebanon early on adopted a dispensational theology. They believed that the role of the church was to evangelize and not to be concerned with issues of social justice. They believed that the church should be concerned with the salvation of souls. Making the world a better place and promoting kingdom values were not seen as the role of the church. Social justice and evangelism were seen as mutually exclusive. The role of the church is to evangelize. Advocating for social justice is the role of NGOs. Third, we had the love problem. I grew up going to church and I grew up not loving my neighbor. This was the dominant attitude in our churches by the time that more than a million Syrian refugees, mostly Muslim, flooded Lebanon more than 10 years ago. Many Lebanese had feelings of hatred towards Syrians who were involved in our Lebanese civil war. Add to that the deep-seated tension between Christians and Muslim communities. Consequently, the Lebanese were less welcoming of the Syrian refugees. That same sentiment was prevailing in our churches as well. Our church communities were the least likely group of people to serve and care for the Syrian refugees. No one expected that our churches would provide the proper response. Fortunately, the story does not end here. The story of the church in Lebanon is an amazing story of transformation. God has been using the turmoil and the various crises to grow and mature his church into becoming a faithful witness to his love for the nations of the world. First and foremost, the church in Lebanon is learning how to love others with the love of Jesus. By living out this love, the church is discovering a multifaceted gospel that leads to integral mission, serving others in word and deed. What is fascinating is that as the refugee populations surrounded our church communities, our churches did not stop and rethink their theology and missiology to discover the appropriate response. Rather, the Holy Spirit moved the hearts of people to respond. He gave them love and concern that they had not experienced before. In a sense, the church's praxis changed because of a heart change rather than a mind change. The changed heart in our churches is driving a rethinking of our understanding of the gospel rather than the other way around. God has been transforming our thinking and theology at the seminary level and transforming the heart of the church at the praxis level. The two dimensions are intersecting in a fascinating way, a way that can only be orchestrated by God. Our churches were mostly absent from the public sphere during the Lebanese Civil War, 1975 through 1990. Today, after more than 10 years of a mega refugee crisis, after an economic meltdown, a political and social uprising, a pandemic and a healthcare crisis, and an explosion that destroyed a big part of Beirut, you do not have to look far to find the church. Just go down to the streets of Beirut. You will find church communities cleaning, repairing, feeding, comforting, healing, praying, and loving the world in the name of Jesus. A fascinating story of transformation. To go back to the church reaction analysis, the Lebanese church reaction has been gradually progressing from that of resignation and immigration to engagement, prophetic engagement. The church is no longer in hiding, caring only for its own. The church is now out there where it is difficult and risky, proclaiming the love of God in ways that touch people's hearts, bringing hope and joy to a hopeless and suffering world. Social justice and evangelism are no longer mutually exclusive. They have become directly connected. As our church communities are growing in their likeness of Jesus, the separating boundaries between word and deed are getting blurred. They are becoming two inseparable dimensions of the same gospel. As a result, the gospel is being proclaimed more widely than ever before, reaching people groups that were not thought previously accessible. In the middle of the darkness that Lebanon is passing through, God's redemptive work is bringing light out of this darkness through the work of a transformed church. So, how do we grow in our understanding and advocacy of justice in a context like ours? We learn a lot from our sisters and brothers in the West, but we do not have the luxury of being a majority. 
lobbying those in power and influencing legislation may not be fruitful or effective. We must find better ways of inspiring and modeling social justice in our communities. It all starts with the church. The kingdom began in Jesus and is best manifested through his body, the church. Accordingly, the church can learn a lot from how Jesus confronted injustice. Glenn Stassen and David Goshi, in their book Kingdom Ethics, identify four ways that Jesus confronted injustice. First, Jesus confronted the injustice of greed and justice for the poor and hungry. Jesus taught that God cared deeply for the poor and the hungry. He taught and he fed. The disciples learned that from Jesus and started the practice of sharing their resources with those in need. I believe that confronting this injustice starts by fighting greed within our own communities and taking the poor as seriously as God does. Second, Jesus confronted the injustice of domination. He did that by criticizing the religious leaders of his day. He taught servanthood instead. Our dominant culture today reveres religious leaders, not too differently from how the Pharisees were treated in their day. What a powerful example it would be when our leaders act as servants and not expect positions of honor in society. Third, Jesus confronted the injustice of violence. Jesus shared the Father's passion for peace he taught transforming initiatives of peacemaking and lived the way of deliverance from violence. I have to admit that it pains me to see church communities that are issues driven and, not, and are not too willing to go to battle for their issues. What a model it would be for our church communities to be kingdom driven, living out kingdom values and loudly proclaim the reign of God. Fourth, Jesus confronted the injustice of exclusion from community. Jesus deeply cared for the excluded and the marginalized and invited them into community with his disciples. Jesus did not expect others to conform to certain religious norms before they are accepted. Instead, he invited them into community that eventually shaped them and their journey with God. Loving justice, pursuing justice, and modeling justice are not optional for a follower of Christ. My prayer is that we, the global body of Christ, seriously examine our attitudes and actions against the backdrop of the Bible's repeated revelations of God's concern for justice. Loving justice, pursuing justice, and modeling justice are not optional for a follower of Christ. These are special challenges for us all, no matter where we live and what circumstances we find ourselves in. As we reflect on what we have heard and seen so far today, we invite you to take some time to reflect and pray now. Our prayer will be guided by some of the creative artists from Alfred Street Baptist Church in Virginia, USA. Let us pray for our broken world. Let us pray for the world created by God, this world that reflects His majesty and power, that we will be worthy stewards of this great gift He has given us and seek to safeguard its purity, accessibility, and beauty, and seek restoration where it is scarred beyond recognition. Let us pray into areas of injustices across this world. Let us ask God to open our eyes to injustices and other areas of brokenness in our immediate environments and further afield. Let us ask God to show us where we can serve Him, to work for justice. Let us ask Him to show us who our neighbour is, our local or global neighbour that needs us to act or speak on their behalf. Let us ask Him for courage to speak out. God bless you as you reflect, pray and trust Him.
continuing in an attitude of prayer, in the midst of this broken world, let us declare truths that bind us together. Please refer to your worship guide for Friday and join me in declaring these words in bold. Some say there is no God. But, but we, we declare, declare that, that, that this world is the creation of a supreme, supreme being who is love. Some say God created, but he left us alone. But, but we, we declare this, this creation is at the core of his heart, heart and he is, is intimately involved. Some say humans are one of many species. But, but we, we declare God has created us for a special purpose to rule and steward his creation with love, to be the lead worshipers as we offer praise back to our creator. Some say we answer only to ourselves, but we declare we have broken God's laws and need forgiveness and restoration. Some say Jesus was a great man. But, but we, we declare he was God in human form who came to earth to show us God's face and, and to take the punishment that was due to us. Some say we will see heaven after we die. But, but we declare that, that heaven the kingdom, kingdom of God is invading earth now. And we see heaven breaking into this world whenever and wherever the people of God worship him through the sacrificial giving of their lives to others in his service. Some say human history is an endless circle. But, but we, we declare, declare it started with God, God and, and will, will end with God. God. He, he will restore this earth to the beauty of the original creation, and we will live in perfect harmony with, with our, our Creator. Creator. Amen. Amen. BWA has long stood in support of religious freedom, human rights, and justice. To recognize leadership in this area, the Congress Quinquennial Human Rights Award is given for a lifetime of achievement to an individual who has shown significant accomplishments in global advocacy for human rights and the pursuit of social justice and peace. Awarded every five years in conjunction with the Baptist World Congress, past recipients include Lauren Bethel, Saul Simon, and former U.S. President Jimmy Carter. Today, the legacy continues. It is truly my honor today to welcome a new leader to this legacy of leadership in the area of human rights. It is particularly special to me because of the long friendship I have shared with this man and the impact of his life and ministry that I have witnessed firsthand. I will now read a citation in recognition of his faithful service. Dr. Raúl Cialaba has been involved in the life of Baptist churches since his childhood and has been a leader within the Baptist World Alliance for decades, including service as a Baptist vice president and a member of many executive committees. He also served on the BWA Commissions on Religious Freedom Freedom and Justice, and Baptist Against Racism. Dr. Celava has been a defender of religious freedom in Argentina and throughout Latin America. In addition to being a voice for Baptist in different areas of the Argentina national government, he helped create and lead Calil, 
Argentine Council for Religious Freedom, being his president three times. In 2019, he worked in conjunction with Peter UA General Secretary Elijah Brown to liberate Gregory Jose Perez, executive director of the Venezuelan youth, who had been incarcerated by the Maduro regime. He also raised funds for Arepitas de Vida, a ministry providing meals and resources for thousands of needy children in Venezuela. As a, a representative of Calir, Dr. Celava participated in the Ministry to Advance Religious Freedom Forum in 2018 at an international event which gathered hundreds of government representatives, religious leaders, survivors of religious persecution, and members of civil society for the advancement of religious freedom. As a layman, Dr. Shalaba offers to others a wonderful example of what it means to serve Christ in the midst of their daily lives and leaves before us all the Baptist emphasis on the priesthood of our believers. His testimony is an inspiration to others to exercise the ministry God has given them as the people of God. With this award, the Baptist World Alliance honors Dr. Raúl Cialaba for his unwavering commitment to the rights of men, women, and children around the world, and a lifetime of faithful and impactful service to Christian kingdom. On behalf of the Global Baptist Family, it is my honor to present the 2020 Congress King Kenyan Human Rights Award to Dr. Raul Sialaba. Thank you, Mr. President. I would like to sincerely thank the Baptist World Alliance, my brothers and sisters of the Argentine Baptist Association, and particularly my wife Silvia and my children Federico, Florencia, and Alejandra for this undeserved distinction. In receiving it, I would like to honor so many brothers and sisters who precede us and who have contributed and are currently contributing in a great way to the defense of human rights and religious freedom. Our honor to them will always entail a deep commitment to continue their work. Ultimately, our desire for religious freedom is nothing more or less than our desire to faithfully follow our Lord Jesus Christ. As Baptists, we must treasure our commitment to religious liberty, which has been one of our standards for more than 400 years. I have worked all these years with the deep conviction of making a concrete contribution to the vigorous defense of freedom of conscience and religious, both at the individual and social levels. The extreme secularism that today pervades the world attempt to eliminate God from the public scene and to anew any religious pressing presence denying freedom itself. In this context, and despite being a basic human right, two-thirds of the world population suffers today persecution or severe restrictions on this freedom. And Christianity, in particular, is being persecuted as never before in the history of humanity. Even in countries with strong pluralistic traditions, freedom is violated with respect to minorities. We must be, as Baptists, the voice of the voiceless. I would like to invite you to pray with me now. Dear Lord, in accepting this award, I would like to remember those around the world who, at this very moment, are suffering persecution and restrictions because of their religion or belief. 
those who are unable to expose, expose their beliefs or manifest them publicly, those who suffer imprisonment, persecution, or exile, those who are discriminated against or whose civil or political rights are diminished on religious grounds, those who are mocked or scorned because of their faith, those who are forbidden to preach or change their religion, those whose civil or political rights are restricted for religious reasons, those who, being religious minority, suffer aggressions that go as far as physical extermination. Our prayer, O oh Lord, and commitment will always be with them. In Jesus Christ, Amen.
together. The theme of the 22nd Baptist World Congress issues a call to Baptists worldwide to celebrate the oneness that Jesus Christ taught his disciples despite the differences in personality, experience, expectation, and preference. It issues a call to find security in a network of mutuality in which exists shared beliefs and to journey with people in their lived experience while at the same time becoming indulgent in practices which shape living in community and engender meaningful partnerships. It also issues a call to live more responsibly to the mysterious grace of God in creation, to the redemptive presence of Jesus Christ, and to the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit as a community of faith. The call issued by the theme together embodies the claim of a quality of life which proclaims God's justice for all creation. How do we then understand together in justice? God's justice is a point of departure. God's creative activity in creation affirms God's commitment to creation, that is, a commitment shaped by God's self-giving love to transform the brokenness of creation generated by acts of injustice. God's justice pays attention to the relationships between God, people, and the rest of creation. It is about respecting the humanity of every person, despite human diversity. It means bearing evidence of a commitment to a shared life, which nurtures a value system in which all people feel included and is a response to the work of inclusivity the Holy Spirit performs. It means standing in solidarity with all of creation by honoring its integrity. It also means bearing witness of God's covenantal relationship with us, that relationship which fuels our declaration of God's justice for all creation. The global Christian community is often confronted with the challenge to witness to the power of God in the face of contesting loyalties, the gods of the world. In the book of the prophet Isaiah, Israel is summoned by God to respond to the struggle of a divided loyalty at a time when they faced an uncertain future and felt threatened by the perceived instability of life outside of Babylon. Uncertainty and instability are among the factors with which the global Christian community has to contend. These often emerge from the desire that life be appropriated in ways reflecting individual choice, especially when theories, concepts, perspectives and practices no longer attend to personal points of crisis or need. Status or position, wealth or possession, influence or power, indulgence or pleasures become the voices of appeal and coercion. These gods of the world speak in defiant tones and agitate for the admiration of results, which leads to a divisive and alienated creation. These gods of the world are banded as a curative means by which the conditions of people may be changed, but instead, fuel inequalities in socio-political, socio-economic, and socio-religious systems, and in human relationships. They are also often cast as a seat of influence, which emphasizes submission and human dependency. Just as Israel was invited to bear witness of the Lord's claims of power over all other powers, the global Christian community is summoned by the Lord God to be the witness of God's reign. By this token, the entrapment of dependence and subjugation would be disrobed, and supportive structures would be created in order to provide the vulnerable and disadvantaged with the means to live a meaningful life. The Luke and description of Jesus' public ministry, Luke chapter 4, verse 14 to verse 19, calls into question the boundaries erected as systems of control which keep others in their place and which emerge from the desire for self-preservation and self-gratification. The injustices present in the world are the product of the advancement of personal agendas, which give ultimacy to status or position, wealth or possession, influence or power, self-indulgence or pleasures, 
the gods of the world. The dedication to what takes prominence of place renders a people's culture inferior, fails to affirm a people's identity, devalues a people's worth, and blatantly disregards human responsibility to care for the environment. The self-oriented and ego-driven desire for dominance results in injustices which are evident in inequities due to particular positions held within structures of power. These include discrimination in employment, such as the right to promotion and rates of pay, and discrimination in lending opportunities. It also includes forced child labor, violence against children, gender-based violence, and the isolation between economic development and environmental policies from which the ecological crisis stems. Jesus' public ministry presents a vision of affecting change in the midst of injustices contained within the reign of dominance which hinders solidarity and limits self-definition. It is the power of the Spirit which is to be granted exclusive claim, not so that the Church can see through her own prisms of privilege and self-induced power or be granted exclusive favours, but so that by the Church's life and worship a new spirituality will take shape born out of an exclusive loyalty to the power of the Spirit. It is this same power on which the Church depends, so that in her liturgical life and interaction with the Word of God, the Church is able to be the agent of resistance to the seat of influence which rejects God's concern for justice. At the heart of the continuous struggle for justice is the marginalized of the world. These are the ones who seek answers to the question, where is God in my displacement? These include migrants, refugees, the landless, abused, and poor. They often battle derision and dismissal while attempting to assert their legitimacy, which is often constrained by the struggle for self-understanding and self-appreciation. Agencies of socialization are often challenged. These include the family, educational institutions, peer groups and mass media. These agencies, which are usually governed by cooperation, direction and influence, make the effort to embolden those within them to claim their social space. The difficulty with affirming their social space, however, is that a recognition of say must take place within a society which fails to insist on resisting biases of race, class, culture, gender, religion, politics, and so on. The marginalized of the world, therefore, suffer from a confinement to spaces where privileges are limited or non-existent. They are the vulnerable and disadvantaged of the world. In its mission, the global Christian community serves the marginalized of the world with God's vision for creation in view, righteousness, holiness, and godliness. Israel in Isaiah 43 was asked to identify with the reality of what God was doing in ways congruent with God's vision for creation. They were also asked to resist the perception that there were other realities which could accomplish same. God is presented as a God who journeys alongside and stays with a people in their solidarity. Do we then hear a call to neighborliness? The Levitical text issues this call. Accordingly, neighborliness reflects God's own compassion, is an act of love and devotion to God, and is a manifestation of the grace of God working in the lives of all people regardless of who they are. The task of being a neighbor is for the sake of the transformation of the world in ways which align with God's vision for creation and which reveal the selflessness of the Creator. This transformation rests upon the satisfaction of imperative human aspirations such as liberty, dignity, and personal fulfillment for all. The united efforts of the global Christian community, including the worldwide Baptist family, to serve the marginalized of the world must be concerned with the continuing process of transformation. This is intrinsic to a focus on independent and critical thinking, 
capacity building, the pursuit of relevant creative energies for productivity, efficiency, a mentally healthy community, and realizing each person's potential away from the confines of stereotypes. Justice for the marginalized of the world reaffirms God's incarnational reality and exposes the redemptive ministry of Jesus Christ as described in Luke 4, 14 to 19. Jesus' mission was to enter into the spaces of the displaced, the rejected, the unloved, and the unwanted in order to share with them his redemptive and salvific nature wherever they were to be found. God in Jesus Christ shares in the actual situations of the marginalized, the migrants, refugees, landless, abused, and poor by entering into their toil, suffering, and alienation, or by being present in their displacement. It is the global Christian community, the church, through whom this is accomplished. We bear faithful witness of God's incarnational mission by our involvement in the lives of those whose total welfare and well-being of body, mind, and soul causes us great concern. Here is the offer of Christ's presence, of Christ in the midst. Here is the offer of an intimate space that is not out of bounds nor off limits. Here is an opportunity to be bound to a partnership with those whom Jesus dared to welcome and those to whom he extended his hospitality. The global Christian community are spirit-led advocates for those treated unjustly. As we confront the gods of the world and respond to the challenges associated with the marginalized of our world, it is our task to commit to the following. One, admitting in our liturgical and worship life that God's redemptive work in Jesus Christ and in the power of the Holy Spirit celebrates human beings as a crown of God's creation, rendering none as inferior. Two, recognizing perfect unity in community, patterned by the triune God, while declaring equality in work and witness. And three, communicating the just nature of God, who charts the course for just treatment of all. We must also consider how the witness of our faith commitment will impact lives in practical ways. What I will now advance is in keeping with some of the injustices mentioned earlier in this presentation. The witness of our faith commitment will impact lives in practical ways through partnerships with employers, relevant agencies and government ministries to make the workplace equitable, diverse and inclusive where no employee is refused the right to employment opportunities or benefits, with financial institutions, agencies and government ministries to seize predatory lending by providing an avenue for financial opportunity by ease of access to lending rates and with support services which tackle the issues of gender inequality, the attitudes and behaviors which disempower and discriminate and which put in place the necessary systems and mechanisms to prevent, reduce, and respond to gender-based violence. The witness of our faith commitments will also add meaning to human lives by our participation in initiatives which ensure that child protection services are recognized and accessible, offer public education and awareness campaigns on forced child labor and violence against children, and encourage mentorship and foster care, which challenge patterns of acquisition and consumption, which produce unequal distribution of goods and services for the sake of personal gratification, and which ignore environmental costs to pursue economic growth and profitability, which address the inaccessibility to basic amenities and the barriers to healthcare faced by migrants, refugees, and the poor and which create the conditions for the voices of the marginalized to be heard. In concluding, sisters, brothers, friends, all, let us collectively affirm the Lordship of Christ by an authentic living which models what the human community must look like despite human diversity. Let us in the power of the Spirit of Almighty God be more intensive and more demanding in our mission to overcome the barriers enforced by the devotees to the gods of the world 
and to intentionally defend the value, dignity, and worth of the marginalized of the world while affirming God's continued incarnational presence. In solidarity, we will stand together in justice. As we reflect on Karen's powerful words, as well as all that we have heard today, God has spoken. As Pastor Karen Curlew is just so insightfully challenged, will we live as a neighbor? There are a number of ways we could do this, but would you allow me to suggest just a few? First, we can pray. Would you pray regularly for the Holy Spirit to transform the injustices of the world? Sign up today for the BWA One in Prayer. This weekly email will help you pray through the countries of the world with insight from Baptists around the world. I will long remember being in northern Nigeria and interviewing a woman who'd been held captive by Boko Haram. She described all the horrific uh, experiences that you might imagine. And then we asked her this question, is there one message you would like to share with the global church? She responded, yes. Would you let the church know around the world that I am praying for them? I am praying that they would never know the experiences of injustice that I have known. If those who've been held captive by Boko Haram are praying for us, would we pray together with them? Second, you can partner. When you give to the BWA, you are partnering to stand for justice. The BWA is standing with those who've been put in prison unjustly. We're standing together with those who are facing religious freedom restrictions and persecution in areas around the world, including just in this year in Europe, Africa, the Middle East, and in Asia. We're standing together with those who are facing domestic violence. We're working to provide food for those who are facing hunger, provide advocacy in the United Nations, Washington, D.C., and around the world, championing the equitable worldwide distribution of the COVID-19 vaccine and working on behalf of racial justice. When you give to the BWA, you are partnering to make a difference for justice. Finally, can I call on you to participate? Earlier this year, the military of Myanmar overthrew the elected government. Last year, the Myanmar Baptist Convention was the second fastest growing Baptist convention in the world. Today, these 1.7 million Baptist brothers and sisters are living in the crossfire. And our concern is not just for them, but for all of the citizens of the country, including the Rohingya Muslims who continue to experience the reverberations of genocide. We've heard from Baptists in Myanmar who've described surviving the aerial bombardments that have fallen in their direct vicinity. We've heard from Baptist professors who had to flee in the middle of the night in order to avoid military convoys that had converged in order to arrest them. We've heard from Baptist professionals who are serving in the medical front lines. Would you participate? These Baptist brothers and sisters in Myanmar need your voice as their neighbor today. As one Baptist leader in Myanmar urged, will the international faith community raise their voices for the victims? Would you go today to baptistworld.org slash Myanmar? You can participate today in a full advocacy campaign that is waiting for you. There are ideas about what you can post to social media, advocacy letters that you can send and prayers that you can share, as well as ways you can give. Will you stand together with them 
as their neighbor. Your voice is needed today. As you take the opportunity to respond as God leads, we invite you to reflect on and pray the words of the song sung now by the Sakini brothers and family from Nazareth, Israel.
Psalm 104. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Come, let's join our hearts and lift up the name of Jesus. Come set your rule and your reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we are made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope Like wildfire in our very souls Holy Spirit come invade us now We are your church And we need your power in us We seek your kingdom first We hunger And we pray 
As we draw today's celebration to a close, can I remind you that tomorrow we'll be celebrating the Lord's Supper together. We encourage you come prepared with wine or juice and bread or something else to eat, to share with those you may be watching with, and the whole family, as we gather together in this different way and remember our Lord Jesus and His sacrifice for us. And now, today, let us remember we are called to be a prophetic people, working for justice, resisting violence, and challenging the abuse of power. We are called to, an, to be an inclusive people, pulling down the walls of prejudice and welcoming the stranger. We are called to be a sacrificial people, risking uncertainty, becoming vulnerable and reflecting the generosity of God. We are called to be a missionary people, demonstrating in word and action the redeeming love of God in this world. Today, as we go forth, may we love with all sincerity, hate what is evil, cling to what is good, be joyful in hope, patient in suffering and affliction, faithful in prayer. Bless those who persecute us. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn, and live in harmony with one another. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and in us all. Amen. <laughs>